Good morning. Good morning, Terra Nova Church family. Today is our final Sunday in Advent uh, before we gather again in one week at Victorious Life for our Christmas Eve service. And over the past few weeks, we have journeyed through the themes of Advent of hope, peace, joy. And today we, we center in and we reflect on God's love for us in Jesus. And, and Junha is going to come and bring the word in, in a bit. Uh, but I'm sure for, for some of you, if you're anything like myself, because we are more universal than we are unique, um, you're probably exhausted at this point. Like you've, you've gotten to this point and you're just thinking just one more week, right? Just one more week and, and Christmas will be here and all the things that we've done uh, all kind of comes together at this one time. Soon we'll get back to normal, right? January 1, everybody looks forward to that. So whenever Christmas, whenever this season becomes a burden, it's a sign that, that we've taken on something uh, of the world and not of Christ. We've, we've put something in place of Jesus. Um, so what, what, if, what if we laid down our expectations? What if we laid down our work, our plans, our things, and we simply waited with an expectation and your eyes wide open to what Christ is trying to do? Because Christmas uh, can't be bought, um, it can't be created or produced, um, it can only be found in Christ. It can only be found in the cradle and the cross. So let's fix our eyes on, on Jesus, our hearts on Christ alone, as we enter into this last service before we, we celebrate Christmas together. We're going to have um, the, the final piece of the, the Christ story. Uh, Angel's going to read it and uh, we've had three candles lit, and Ben and Grace are going to come and light the fourth candle before um, we light the Christ candle on Christmas Eve. So, uh, Ben and Grace, you can come forward, and Angel's going to read the story, and then we'll enter into song. Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 55. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Amen. Let's stand. Let's worship him this morning.
Would you join me in this responsive reading? I'll lead us out and then we can all say this together. The coming of our Lord is near and we wait in joyful expectation. Draw close, Lord Jesus. Shed your light on all that is filled with darkness. The coming of our Lord is near and we wait with hope-filled hearts. Draw close, God's beloved Son. Teach us the wonder of your all-embracing love. I'm going to teach you an old, new hymn here this morning, talking about the love of God, focusing on the, the hymn, uh, the, the theme of love this morning. So uh, I'm pretty sure you can catch on. It's, it's, um, it's simple.
thank you that you do not give to us what we what we deserve what is rightfully ours God the judgment that we deserve is something that only perfect love given to us Father so as we as we sit and as we hear your words this morning help us to be reminded of that love that is so vast that is endless that we didn't deserve but Father for those that have called Christ their Lord and Savior, you gave them the right to be called children of God. So thank you, Father, that we can approach you because of what you have given to us in Jesus. Not just in the cradle, but on the cross, and one day we'll return for his bride. Father, be with your servant as he comes and he brings your word for your people. This is all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Good morning. Good morning, church. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Junha. I serve as an intern here. And today, we are in the last week of our Advent series. As mentioned throughout the series, Advent is a season of waiting. Uh, we look back to the first arrival of Jesus, but we also look forward to the future. But for us, in the present moment, we live in the in-between. We live in between two Advents. We still live in a world leaking with pain and suffering. There's wars and violence. There's mental health issues, depression, loneliness, division. And as Pastor Jason mentioned last week, we still battle with sin and flesh and the devil. And we grieve and we mourn and we suffer deep, deep loss. And the list can go on and on. We are, as what uh, writer Fleming Rutledge puts it, in the heart of darkness. And as the darkness presses in and the brokenness that we feel can be suffocating and the light in our hearts can be snuffed out. And we might ask in the world that we live in, is peace possible here? Is hope possible here? Is joy possible here? Rutledge again says that in the Advent darkness, the only possibility is the impossibility of the intervention of God. And each week, we've been saying that the impossible has happened in Christ, that Christ has intervened into our world, that in the arrival of Christ, what seems impossible is possible. Because of him, like the candles we've been lighting each week, peace can begin to burn again. Hope can burn again. Joy can burn again. And today we'll look at love, that because the God of love has intervened, that love is possible here, and that love can begin to burn in our hearts again. And today we'll look at 1 John chapter 4, 7 through 12. Um, I'm going to read the passage for us and briefly pray for our time together, um, and then we'll dive in. John says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. 
In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. God, we just thank you for your word, your word that are your words of love. And God, as we have been celebrating each week of your advent, we ask for your advent of your spirit now to show us your love, to manifest your love into our hearts. And God, would we all be like Mary and receive your love um, into our hearts that we may birth love out in this world. God, be with us um, and saturate this time with your spirit and your love. We pray these things in Christ's name. So the main idea for today is that God's love compels us to be loving people. God's love compels us to be loving people. And our roadmap today will be the source of God's love, the shape of God's love, and the visibility of God's love. First, the source. John says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. John here encourages us to love. He says we should love because we know him and we're born of him. And those who don't love don't know him as the God of love. Now, when I was preparing the phrase God is love in verse 8 stuck out. Given the heart of darkness that we live in and experience, I wonder, does this ring true for you? Does it ring true for me that God is love. I think sometimes in our difficult moments, we can start to question God's love. We might say things like, God, if you were really love, I wouldn't be in this situation right now. If you were really love, you would get me out of this circumstance. You would get me this job. I wouldn't be struggling financially. I would have passed this test. You would have gotten me the bye in my fantasy football playoffs. (laughs) What is it for you that makes you question God's love? But I wonder if this statement by John that God is love can serve as a sort of anchor for us. Because the truth is, whatever we go through, whatever hardship, and whatever you feel about God, it won't change who he is. He is a God of love. That's who he is today. That's who he is tomorrow. That's who he is forevermore, as Hebrews 13 tells us. He does not change. He will always be love. And as one commentator writes, all of God's activity is loving activity. And if that's the case, maybe what John and what that phrase kind of invites us to is a perspective shift that instead of letting our circumstances dictate and shape whether God is loving or not, but rather to let God who is love to see our circumstances differently. And perhaps underneath that pain and the suffering and underneath the darkness that we go through, there's a gift there for us, that we trust that his loving presence will meet meet us there, meet us in the darkness. And isn't that Advent that love came down at Christmas, that love came into the darkness? And the mystery of Advent is that it happens in a way that we don't expect. It doesn't come pretty in a nice box with a bow on it underneath a tree, but love can come and often does come in a small and hidden way, like Jesus coming in the form of a baby baby hidden inside a barn. And perhaps what we need is new eyes to see that, to see that love. And I think this is important because seeing God as love will help us to see those around us differently. If God is love, he's created the world. He sustains the world. He redeems the world in love. That means those made in his image and those those in the world he has created created deeply matter to him and are deeply important to him. And those who who know him and have been born of him share in this love. We love what he loves. The people in the world that matter to him begins to matter to us. However, you might be already asking yourself this, whether you're a Christian or not today. Do you need to know God to love John says, anyone who does not love does not know God. Does that mean that those who don't believe in God can't love? No, right? We we, we see people loving their friends, their family, 
their community is strangers. And this is good. This is beautiful. It, it, it shows that we are made in the image of the one who is love. So what is the love that John talks about here that requires knowing him and being born of him? The love John is using is this agape love. John Stott, he describes it as a self-sacrificial love, the seeking of another's positive good at one's own cost. Pastor Torrey called it a one-way love. Another writer distinguishes love from affections. He says, affection is not love. It's an expression of God's love. Love is a settled will working in the direction of another for the growth of their good. And if I were to maybe put all that in a sentence, God's love is his unconditional, sacrificial commitment to the good and flourishing of others, even his enemies, even at great cost to himself. So if this describes God's love, how did he show us this love? How did he love us in this way? That leads me to my second point, the shape of God's love. John writes, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. John writes here that the way God showed us love was in sending his son. And no, John says he gave us his only son. He's conveying just how precious the son is to the father, the son that he spent eternity with in loving communion and fellowship before the foundation of the world, the one he calls his beloved son with whom he's well pleased. It's this son he sent as a gift to the world for you and for me, for us. And if love could be measured by how much one is willing to give up for another, then God, God loves us an infinite amount for he gave us his infinite son. In other words, there's no bounds, there's no limits to his love for you. Like we sung today, it's, it's, it's immeasurable. This is why the psalmist sings, your steadfast love extends to the heavens, or your love is higher than the heavens. There was nothing that God wasn't willing to give to the world for its good, even if it meant sending his own son, whom he deeply, deeply loves. He doesn't hold back. He doesn't hold back on us. He gives us heaven's best. He gives us his very heart. John, sa- John Stott says, a greater self-giving than God's gift of his son that has never been nor could be. And this love is even more stunning when we see who he gives this love to. He gives this love, the gift of his son, for undeserving sinners like you and for me, those who actively oppose him, who actively work against the good of others and the world, who are loveless, and who don't love the way we should love. Romans 5.8 says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Rather than giving us what we're owed because of our sin, which is an eternal separation from his presence of peace and joy and hope and love, he gives us his son. He gives us Christ. And how did Christ show us this love? Verse 9 says, he was, sent so that, he was sent so that he may give others life. And he's implying that his whole purpose in being sent here was to give others life. His whole life was committed to the good and the flourishing of others from when he was born to when he died. Matthew 20, 28 says, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The thief only, in John 10, 10, he says, the thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Christ, he didn't come to secure life for himself, to secure money or possessions or power. Rather, he comes to give all of that away, to give himself away for the good of others. He empties himself of life so that we and those who call on him may be full of it. And all throughout the Gospels, you see this life of love in serving others, whether it's healing the sick, the blind, the lame, the lepers, he's raising the dead. You see him show compassion to the outcast, to those on the margins of society. You see him washing the disciples' feet. But I want to zoom in on a scene in Jesus' life briefly where we see this love at work. It's in Luke 22, verses 39 through 46, and Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
And I'm going to read it for us. It'll be on the screen. It says, he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood, falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus telling the disciples this phrase, the Son of Man will be delivered up to be killed at the hands of sinful men. And as his death is approaching, we see him here going to the Father to pray. He says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And here in the garden, we see the settled will here submitted in love for the Father. But we also see in Jesus this deep agony. He's in earnest prayer, and he's sweating drops of blood. Because as he sees the cup he's going to drink, he sees the fullness of God's wrath that he will have to endure. But even more, he sees the separation and the forsakenness he would experience from the Father, his beloved Father, who he spent all of eternity in love with. Yet in view of all this, it didn't keep him in despair. It didn't keep him down. The text says he rose. He rose from prayer. Why? Because as he saw the cup of wrath, he saw something else. He saw that through the cup, he saw through the cup, and he saw the life he could give us. He didn't just see the separation and the forsakenness he would endure. But I believe he saw each one of us here today. He saw your face, and he saw the peace he could give you. He saw the joy he could give you, and he saw the love he could give you. And he said, I'll drink that. And so he rises from prayer. And I like to see this as a mini resurrection because death cannot bury the love he had for us. Death cannot keep him from the life he wanted to give to us. Even the separation from his beloved father, being forsaken by the father whom he loves, cannot keep him from giving us this life. And he shows here that his love is stronger than death. His love is stronger than than death, and he would drink the full cup of this wrath so that we could always drink everlastingly of the cup of his love, the cup of his love. Um, and so this cup was poured out on Jesus on the cross, where John says he was made the propitiation for our sins. And on the cross is where we see the pinnacle of God's love for us. He takes our place and takes on, bears the wrath of God against sin that we deserve. And if you want to know if you're loved today, if you want to know if you have worth, if you want to know if you're valuable to him and, you're, and know your worth, it begins by looking away from our circumstances and looking to the cross. This is what we do week in and week out. We want to come here to see Christ dying for us on the cross on our behalf, to see his love, to see that he said we are worth it to go through the cross for him. To, to go to the cross for us. Christ was willing to give up everything for you to the point of giving up his own life. He entered not only the heart of darkness, but a darkness, that, a darkness that's far more greater than anything we'll ever experience. The wrath, the tragic loss of the father, the forsakenness that he would endure was all worth it to him if it meant giving you life. William Temple says, my worth is what I'm worth to God, and that is a marvelous great deal, for Christ died for me. And our worth is never, as, as, as Jesus shows us, our worth is never dependent on what we do for God, but always dependent on what he does for us in Christ. He doesn't love you because of what you do or don't do, because of your background, what you look like, thank God, right? Your, uh, your resume, your skills, you know, whether you're blue check verified or not on Instagram, he still loves us. And remember, John tells us it's not that we loved him, but that he loved us. It's not that we obeyed perfectly, followed him perfectly, 
loves him perfectly, but it's because he loved us. He doesn't wait for us to get it all together before he dies for us, but it was while we were yet sinners he did. And this is the love that is secure and enduring. This is the love that we can trust. And in your moments of failure, when you've dropped the ball and you've just blown it, your lovelessness and your, your failures and your mistake cannot shake God's love for you. And conversely, like your, your obedience and your faithfulness also doesn't secure God's love for you. And this means we don't have to spend our lives in fear of losing this love. We also don't have to spend our lives trying to secure God's love. But we're finally free to just love, to spend our lives in love. And this, is, and this love is what compels us to love one another. And this leads me to my last point, the visibility of love. John says, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Note here how John intensifies the encouragement in verse 7 into a command. In verse 7, he says, let us love one another. Here he says, we ought to love one another. John's telling us, man, if God loved us like this, if he was willing to send his son and Christ was willing to come from heaven to earth and give up his life for us, then we, we got to love like this. We got to love. And we look at people differently. Those who are sitting next to you, those in our church, in our community, maybe those we just have a difficult time with, people we wouldn't normally um, want to be with, these are all people that Christ was willing to die for. They're precious to God. And so they become precious to us. And it should, make, and it, and it should um, produce in us that kind of same love. And we seek the good and the flourishing of them. And again, we don't earn God's love when we do this, but this love, his love, changes us. Now, I'm reminded of when uh, Jesus told Peter to cast his net out after Peter spent, like, all day fishing. He's like, what? You want me to cast my net out after I just fished all day and didn't catch anything? And when Peter pulls up this abundance of fish to the point where the nets are breaking, Peter responds by saying, depart from me, for, I'm sinf- for I am a sinful man. And what's going on there? It was the abundance and generosity of God that made Peter repent and change. And in a similar way, I think when we receive this love, it changes us. It compels us to move away from uh, solely seeking our own good and our own flourishing, our own comforts, and it moves us to be committed to another's good for their flourishing. And it empowers us because if God has secured life for us, if he secures us in love and he holds us in love, and we know that he'll always care for us and provide for us, that he will never leave us or forsake us, we don't, always, we don't have to be um, gripping onto our lives, gripping onto what we have, but his grip on us can make us loosen our grip on our lives, and we can give our lives away. We freely give our time, our talents, our resources, and love for others in service of them, uh, to, build them up, to build them up. And at a deeper level, I believe that God's love compels us to love others solely for their sake. And I think one of the things that get in the way of real love for us sometimes is that we spend so much time trying to be lovable to others, trying to get their attention, trying to be acknowledged, trying to be seen, that we actually never end up loving. All of our acts of love are really just ways to be loved by them than rather rather than out of a love for them. It's it's this self-seeking love, although we do this outward acts of love. But if we have the secure love of the Father, we can freely love solely for their sake, solely for them, regardless of their response or regardless of how they, um, whether they reciprocate our love or whether they appreciate our love, we can solely love them because Christ loves them and Christ was willing to die for them. But also through Christ, we're also able to love across differences. He was sent into a world. When John says Jesus was sent, he was sent into the world, he was sent into a world completely different from the one that he knew. And he came to a people completely different from himself. Heaven was a place of love 
and holiness. And he comes to an earth marked by death and sin. He was God, but he became, became man. But the differences didn't turn him away from us, didn't turn him away from us, but he loved across our differences. And I think this empowers us also to love across differences, whether it's age or culture or background. God's love compels us to love those we normally wouldn't be with, normally we wouldn't want to spend time with. And it loves and it moves us to have this unifying type of love that we love each other across our differences. And so family, what would it look like for us to love like this? To love sacrificially and to have this one-way love and commitment for the other's good? To love sacrificially, to have this one-way love and commitment for another and to love across difference. And I think as John says here, God's love will be perfected in us. Whereas the New Living Translation words, that his love is brought to full expression in us. In other words, God's otherworldly love will be seen through us. The advent of Jesus makes us into these little advents of love to one another and to, to the world. It's through our, the body, through us, the hands and the feet of his church, that those who don't know God's love can tangibly see and hear and touch God, God's love. Or put another way, through the church and through all the tangible acts of love we do in the world and do for one another, it's, it's a way of God saying to, to people, hey, I'm here, and hey, I love you. And would many be able to say, because of Terra Nova, because of us here today, that they were able to see and to know God's love. And today, if you don't know God's love for you, or if you haven't received this love, we would love to pray with you in the corner over there and talk to you about this love. And as the band comes up and we take communion, you may be right now in a tough season of life and you're questioning God's love for you. And as you contemplate before communion, maybe this can be a time where we can look at him loving us, to look at the one who loves us, to look at the one in your agony, to, um, to look at the one who loves you and in your agony to, to bring your agony to the one who agonizes over you and to bring your pain to the one who was in pain for you and to bring your suffering to the one who suffered for you. Sorry. Um, yeah, and then as we take the bread and the, and the cup to know that God's love is as real as the bread you eat and the juice and the cup that you drink. Let me pray for us. God, I, we thank you for your love and for your word, um, for shining your love into this world. And, we, and God, I just ask that your love would be tangibly seen through our lives and through our acts of love. Um, God, be with us, and as we await um, your arrival next week, as we celebrate Christmas, um, we ask that you would fill our hearts um, with your love today. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to take a moment and pause before we celebrate communion and um, the sacrament of his body and his blood, and just be quiet before the Lord coming to him with uh, quietly in confession before we partake uh, of this supper um, the things that we know and even the things we don't know but we're going to do it quietly before him if you if you know that there's something between you and a brother and sister in this in this room I want to encourage you to take a few moments and go and seek them out um, and then we'll give some uh, instructions on how we'll do this and partake together, uh, but let's just be quiet before him now.
Father, we know that we are broken, sinful people before you. But for those that have called Jesus Lord and Savior, you have made us sons and daughters. You have taken our sins from us. You have made us white as snow. God, thank you that you don't give us the things that we deserve, but you extend your love to us in such great measure. We can never repay you. So we thank you. And now as we approach your table, and as we remember the sacrifice of your son, we take this body and we take this blood, and the, the bread and the cup, and we eat and we drink and we remember the sacrifice and the price that was paid for the things that we did and the things that we continue to do. Father, have mercy on us. Be good to us. Continue to show your love to us in tangible ways that we can hold on to and we can know. And let us trust you in the, way, in the times where we don't feel it, that your spirit would be that comfort for us. We lay this all at your feet. Amen. So we're going to have two stations here, um, one on your left, and people will be holding the matzah and the juice, and you can come forward and down that aisle and take it and take the matzah and dip it in the wine of the juice, and there's gluten-free options over here, and they're going to say words over you, like his body broken for you, his blood shed for you, take, eat, and drink, and then on your right, those are the prepackaged elements. You can come forward, uh, take one, and take it back to your seat and eat at your, uh, at your time. And they'll say words over you, his body broken for you, his blood shed for you. Eat, remember. Um, and we'll have time. And if you, you still need more time, that is fine. You can take whatever posture you feel is appropriate for your heart right now. If you want to kneel, sit, stand. Um, but we're going to worship through a couple of songs. Um, as long as it takes for us to go through uh, everyone that has a chance to um, celebrate. And this is for the, the body of Christ. This is for people that call Jesus Lord and Savior. You come and you take and you eat um, with us. So let's sing.
Good morning, church. My name is Jason, for those of you I don't know, and I serve as an elder here. Um, if you're new, welcome. We hope that uh, the Father's deep love uh, was felt in your heart today as we shared and worshiped. Um, we're glad you're here, and if you'd like to get, us, get to know us a bit, you can um, talk to anyone here up on stage, introduce yourself to someone sitting next to you, or you can find out more about us on our, on our webpage. A um, couple of announcements um, before we start. Um, for those that call Terra their home, um, we would ask that you participate in the offering where we give joyfully, sacrificially, and regularly. Um, I'm going to hit pause here and just follow up. Uh, for those of you that were here last week, Pastor Nat talked about some end-of-the-year updates financially. Um, I'm just going to kind of build on that. If you, if you want more detail, you could go back and look at the message on our YouTube page, and Pastor Nat will give you kind of all the details. Um, I'm going to ask as a church that we do three things as we end our year and go into 2024. Um, would you continue to pray for us as elders? As Pastor Nat said, we uh, set the budget every year, uh, this time of year. So ask that you pray that you would give us wisdom as we project out what our needs are, what our expenses are as a church. Um, in 2024, we made some investments in some staff, stepping out in faith that God would meet that provision. Um, and he has. If you haven't noticed, we have two really great godly women on staff who have, who have made made things much easier and um, come alongside us and supported the church, and uh, that's been a great investment. Um, if you were here, Pastor Nat would, would, would have told you that we're a little behind in our giving compared to our projections for 2023, and that's okay. Um, we have savings, and uh, we step out in faith that God will meet those needs, so we just ask as you consider your giving, the second thing I'll ask is that you pray for what you plan to give maybe at the end of the year or in 2024 as we move into that, what your giving looks like. Again, here at Tara, we talk about giving in three ways, sacrificially, joyfully, and regularly. So if you continue to come here regularly, you're part of this church, we would ask you to just be prayerful about what God would put on your heart to give to the church to support the church's need and our mission. Um, one of the things that folks may not know is that 10% of all of the church's giving goes back to help plant churches both locally, nationally, and globally. Um, so we give back even a portion of our um, revenue or expenses that we have. We give that back in, in our ties to planting God's church across this nation. Uh, the last thing I would say is, um, would you just continue to pray for God's provision for Terra Nova as we move into 2024, that he would meet the needs that we have and even the needs that we don't know we have as we move into 2024 because we don't know what the future holds. But would you just be faithful to pray, come alongside us and pray for what God's provision would be for us as a church in 2024. So three things all centered around prayer. Thank you. So I will jump into uh, some of our announcements for today. So first announcement, uh, our young adults group is going Christmas caroling today at 2.30 um, at the Shaker Senior Home in Albany. So after service, if you're a young adult, um, you can go up the road to our Troy offices for a light lunch. You can bring your own. Uh, and then everyone will carpool. No? Okay. Oh, okay. So you're going to Melissa Walkup's house. That sounds way better than the church office. So <laughs> go to Melissa Walkup's house. If you don't know how to get there, she just stood up. She's in the back. She'll happy to give you directions if you need a ride there. Um, see Melissa and she'll help you out. Uh, next thing we've asked this for the last couple Sundays is that we still continue to have needs in Terra Kids. Um, looks like our needs are being met, but we still have some openings. So if you, as you consider how you can give financially, also we would like you to consider how you can serve the church. And this is one great way to continue to serve our young children that need to continually be reminded of and brought up uh, in the Lord. So if you'd help us out and you can meet some of those needs, we would appreciate that. You could email Kayla at TerranovaChurch.com. Dot org, or you could see Kayla after church, which she's right here waving her hand. So thank you, Kayla. Um, number Announcement number four. So that this is if you are looking to join a tribe, we have really two onboarding um, seasons for tribe. One is in September and one is in January. So if you want to be a part of our tribe, that's our communities, our Bible studies where we 
go deeper in the word. We talk about um, the Sunday message. We pray together. We support each other. We serve in those ways. Um, that's what we do in tribes. And if you'd like to join tribe, uh, the window to do that for this this season starts um, now. You can you can email Dennis at TerranovaChurch.org, um, or you can scan the QR code on the guide page and get more information and sign up there. Last announcement. Um, so just a reminder, Christmas Eve is next week, um, but we're not having Christmas Eve service here. Uh, we are having Christmas Eve service at Victorious Life Christian Church just down the road. Two services, 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. Um, service will only be about an hour, so there won't be any child care, so just prepare for that. Um, and there are also our Christmas cards on the table over there that you can feel free to take on your way out, that you can to invite others, family, friends, coworkers to the Christmas Eve service. Again, not going to be here, going to be at Victorious Life down the road. We've done a few services with them, so most of you are probably familiar with that. And that's all I have for announcements. Thanks. Thanks, awesome. Jason. Thanks, Pastor Jason. Also on the table as you leave, there are like a whole bunch of... Uh, ornaments, tea ornaments. Uh, we had them last year and they're left over. So if you didn't get one last year and you want one, or if you just want a second one, grab one uh, as you leave. Uh, they all need to go like some way, somehow. I don't know if you have a tree that you want to put all your tarot tea ornaments on. That's fine. Just make them go. Uh, let's stand uh, and sing as we leave today.
you go. Romans 8, verses 35 through 39 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen, church. Have a great week. See you next week for Christmas Eve.